You've put a lot of work into your digital assets. What are you doing for storage and backups? Long-term migration. I hate when I get a new phone and I have to like reset everything up. It never remembers my preferences. This video is brought to you by Synology and uh, more on the backup aspect and restore, especially in just a second. If you're into computers, it's worth it to put some work into your small office, home office, even your home lab backend setup. So that when you get a new computer or you change devices, you just hit restore. It's easy work. Now I'm not talking about your main computer or anything like that. I'm talking about minimally running some kind of storage on your home network or your small office network, maybe some virtual machines, you know, wherever you happen to need them. things to work and you want things to work reliably, you need a good storage infrastructure. If you do things at work or you want to do things at work for hyper-converged infrastructure, clustering, data resiliency, Kubernetes, container orchestration, I, you know, all the cool stuff, it's possible, but it's also possible to have a relatively low cost lab set up to work on those technologies so that you understand them better. And minimally, you should have a killer backup system out of this setup if you do what I show you in the video. So it's great for small offices, home offices, home lab setups, whatever you wanna do. I wanna set up a backup system to back up all my stuff, my phone, my computers, even the stuff that I've got in the cloud because hey, the cloud is a little bit more ephemeral than we all like to admit, right? It's just other people's computers. Now, if a computer dies, I wanna hit a button and restore everything. I maybe also wanna run some virtual machines to do some stuff when my main computer's off or when I'm doing stuff to it. Maybe I want some resiliency so that if a VM dies or a host computer dies, I can recover really quickly. Well, I've been on a bit of a tear with VMware lately. Tear with VMware, see what I did there? VMware is not free, but for about $200 a year, you can buy what's called the VMUG Advantage membership. And you get a license for just about everything VMware makes, but only for home lab and learning use cases. And that's what I'm using in this video. It's a pretty solid setup. I mean, VMware, I think the technology that they have and the products that they offer, you know, in vSphere and some of the plugins and stuff that goes with vSphere is really nice. So here's my setup. The Synology is central to this setup, but to understand what I've got going here, you know, I've got VMware vSphere 6.7 running on these two ASRock desk mini machines. So one of these has an eight core Ryzen 4750G, 32 gigabytes of memory, and a four terabyte Sabrent rocket drive. It has two two and a half inch SATA bays as well. This tiny little machine, two two and a half inch plus NVMe, is a very effective node for experiments. Eight cores. Now this is not on the VMware hardware compatibility list. Nothing here is, except the Synology actually. They put in a lot of work to get that VMware certification. So uh, also a word of warning about these little VMware machines that are running here. These ASRock machines, as cool as they are, uh, they don't really work with the latest version of VMware, vSphere 7. And that's because of the Realtek NIC that's in both of these. Realtek and VMware have not been getting along lately, and it kind of sucks. There's maybe hope, there's a VMware fling, flings.vmware.com, that enables certain Realtek chipsets to work in certain contexts. They really mean it more for like USB connectivity, but your mileage may vary. You may be able to get it working with different Realtek chipsets. So I may be able to use these on VMware vSphere 7 after all. I don't know, we'll see. Check this out. This is the VMware 8-core Xeon NUC that I re reviewed a while ago. Now it's a, little, it's a little bigger. I mean, if you compare notes here, but this is a true Xeon. It's 32 gigabytes of memory, dual Intel NICs, plus Thunderbolt, plus two expansion slots. It's an X16 slot and an X8 slot, or you can run it, it's X8, X8 if you populate both slots. It's also got plenty of NVMe connectivity, so it's great for that four terabyte NVMe rocket. Quiet as a whisper, and it works out of the box with VMware vSphere 7. So in a nutshell, these three computers can run a VMware cluster and all of my stuff in, in my home lab and all sorts of that really cool stuff. But for this video, let's take a look at storage. This is the Synology DS1821 Plus. I put eight, eight terabyte WD Reds in that. <laughs> These are awesome drives. You ideally wanna get a drive that's rated for use in a NAS. These are helium filled, which means that they're quieter and they're pretty fast, so I like it. Now I'm using a RAID 10 config for speed, but RAID 6 is another option that I would also recommend. Now because I plan to cluster this, you definitely don't wanna use like the hybrid RAID option, you just wanna use a traditional RAID because it doesn't really support cloning that, I think. I've also added an NVMe, 960 gigabytes for caching. 
that's direct from Synology. There's also the, the option of upgrading the memory. More memory is always nice. I've done that too, because you can run in a limited capacity actual containers and virtual machines right from the NAS. Yeah, that's right. This thing has an AMD Ryzen processor in it. Four cores. Now, I wanted a little bit more speed out of my setup than what Gigabit would give me. Synology also has the E10 M20 T1. That's a 10 gigabit add-in card. I highly recommend this card, especially with this NAS because it's got a fast CPU. If you've got a fast network, you can take advantage of it. It gives you a 10 gigabit port and two M.2 ports. How does VMware talk to this ultimately? How does VMware talk to the Synology? Well, you've got options. For this video, we're using a technology called iSCSI that exposes a storage volume that's created on the Synology as a kind of mountable drive on VMware. So on the VMware hosts, it shows up as a data store where we format the volume as a data store and you're pretty much good to go. It's just like a hard drive. Uh, it's a hard drive over the network, except that only one machine can use it at a time. This is really awesome because it separates the compute part of things from the storage part of things. So think about that. It's like if we've got, you know, a bunch of virtual machines running on this machine and it goes down, well, all of the virtual machines can be booted right up here because this one would have access to whatever hard drive this one was using. But basically, you know, if one of these craps out or the power supply dies or it loses the CPU or whatever, the other one can take over the duties of the one that failed. And if you've got three of them or more, you can actually have a whole VMware cluster and VMware's got all kinds of add-ons and other technologies for dealing with that. In a really worst case scenario, because Synology has good VMware integration, you could boot a minimal, like if you've got a really small Active Directory controller that doesn't need a lot of memory, you can boot that directly on the Synology. In the past, I've booted the VMware Witness Appliance on the Synology just to keep things going while I had a node down in a three node cluster, and that worked fine. I've covered all that in the past, in past videos that we've done, so check that out. Now, the Intel NUC, this one, is good enough to use another VMware technology called vSAN, which is a hyperconvergence technology. One cool idea with vSAN is that you can leverage local storage inside each node. So if I had three of these NUCs, I could be using you know, local storage in each one, and you would use the Synology as a backup in that case. You don't really need shared storage because vSAN takes care of replicating the storage to each individual node. So instead of having everything stored on here and everything running over the network, the storage is local, so it's very fast, but you still need fast synchronization between the hosts in order to synchronize the data. So you may be thinking, well, without vSAN, which is a separate product and a, and a separate cost center, uh, let me tell you, the Synology becomes a single point of failure here. I mean, yeah, you've got compute redundancy across these three ESXi compute nodes, but isn't this a single point of failure with the Synology? Well, yes, that's right. But, and this is as cool as heck, if you have a second Synology, you can achieve high availability. One sec, let's configure the new Synology with all of the same configurations. So here we go, 16 gigabytes of RAM, eight terabytes of hard drive, RAID 10, 960 gigabyte NVMe. Let's go to the lab and test this setup. The setup here is really pretty simple. I've got my existing VMware setup and some of the VMs which are currently running off of the Intel NUC. That's what we're looking at here on the screen. I wanna keep my existing data. I just want to add another Synology. I wanna turn it into a high availability setup. The GUI Synology provides makes this really, really painless. Be careful in the GUI though, not to start fresh because that'll, that'll erase everything. We wanna bring in our existing data. When you've got a setup like this, it makes sense to give each Synology a fixed IP address on the network rather than use DHCP for automatic config. Now, I'd previously configured 192.168.1.5 for our primary Synology. I'm just gonna set up the new Synology for 192.168.6. And I'm gonna connect LAN port four on the old Synology to the new one. That's what's called a heartbeat connection. And you'll see that terminology in, in a lot of clustering technologies in VMware, Microsoft Windows clusters, the whole nine yards. We're gonna do a direct network connection, not through a switch, just because there's less stuff to fail. There's some considerations for the uh, heartbeat connection. You should definitely check out the Synology documentation or the thread on the level one forum. But these two Synology DS1821 Plus will synchronize data and also check each other's status over that heartbeat connection. Each of these devices has its own name on the network and they show up individually. But when you set up high availability, a third virtual Synology will show up on the network. 
either one of these Synology units will respond when you connect to that virtual Synology. So you can log into the web GUI and do everything that you normally would through the Synology UI. So the IP that we're gonna configure for that virtual Synology is 192.168.1.7. So either one is gonna respond at that IP and this one configuration change on this one IP will apply to either Synology. And this is the one configuration change I gotta make on the VMware side, because right now it's using .5 in the previous standalone state, and I wanna change it to .7 so that if either one of these Synology devices fail, .7 will always be available. VMware is not gonna notice. You can look at the high availability manager and the latency figure here gives you some idea of how far behind one Synology is from the other in terms of synchronization. Looks like just a couple of milliseconds. So any, anything that happens bad here, Synology's, uh, anything that happens bad here, VMware is not gonna notice. It's gonna take a couple seconds for one of these to notice the other one has died, but that's plenty fast enough for, for VMware to just keep on trucking. With high availability though, your heartbeat connection is ideally the same speed as your fastest network connection. So four gigabit plus one 10 gigabit. You can use the 10 gigabit for heartbeat, but it's not gonna really speed up your network connection unless you use multiple gigabit connections. I want speed, I gotta go fast. So I decided to use the Intel X550 T2. This is a standard PCI Express ethernet card. It has two 10 gigabit interfaces. It's well supported by the Linux OS that's running underneath the Synology OS, the configuration. And that gives us two interfaces, one to use for heartbeat and one to use for the local network. But did you know that Synology also has 25 gigabit upgrade options and beyond? They have even higher end rack mount models where instead of having two Synology boxes like this, it's all integrated in one rack unit. So everything is shared. That dual NAS function is built into one box right out of the box. All right, that's all well and good, but what if we have a catastrophic failure? Well, remember the original Synology. I'm going to unplug it from power. And look at that, VMware just keeps right on going like nothing happened. Even though I've unplugged the primary storage thing that we were using, because I updated the iSCSI, you know, the targets to use the cluster Gigantstore, everything just keeps right on working. In fact, you don't even really get an alert from VMware. Although in vCenter, if you have the health check thing set up, it will actually show you hey, there's a yellow exclamation on this, something isn't perfectly right. Ideally, in the Synology software, you've got it set up to email you, but we can see here in the high availability manager, oh, it knows, it knows something is wrong. So for this reason, I definitely recommend if you're gonna do this setup that you also in include a battery backup in your plans and run uh, you know, independent battery backups or at least you know, have one battery backup that your Synology's run off of because if both of them lose power at the same time when they come back up, it's a little hairier uh, than it would be if they'd been shut down cleanly. But as we can see from this, high availability is working exactly the way that it should. But so in terms of recovering on the storage side, without the high availability, it would take hours or days to restore from backup and bring the VM back up again. So if you only had your VM stored locally and this thing went kaput, you know, are you gonna take the M.2 out? Are you gonna go to a backup? What are you gonna do? It's gonna take a long time, hours, maybe days. Any critical stuff that you have for high availability, you know, in this video, I've shown you a relatively straightforward way to do that with VMware plus Synology. Yeah, Synology is a little cheaper than like a dedicated SAN appliance, but you can do this just as well with Hyper-V or Proxmox or other virtualization technologies, the same level of high availability. And VMware can do this kind of thing internally too. You know, there's a new uh, technology, I guess, from VMware called vSAN. And the idea with vSAN is to move the storage inside the compute nodes and it manages replication of storage between compute nodes. And then in that scenario, your Synology takes the role of a backup or standby data store. Your VMs don't end up actually running from the Synology in that case, although they could in the event of disaster recovery. But in that scenario, you have the same local storage spread evenly across all of your compute nodes. That's a little complex to set up, and that's why we have new words like hyperconverged. We've got our hyperconverged infrastructure. Now, I truly believe that software-defined infrastructure is the answer to our complex problems in computation at the small scale and the large scale. Synology gives you the flexibility so that it can play whatever role. Backups, replication, high availability, can basically do it all. 
it can grow with you because in this setup, you know, I started with a single standalone Synology and then started to do more important stuff. And it's like, hey, I, I need something more like high availability. So I just deployed a uh, secondary Synology NAS and added it to the first one. And now I have high availability, which is pretty awesome. So that's pretty much all there is to the replication side of things. The first step is really to just plug in the other Synology NAS. I'm Port four, like I said, port one is the one connected to the LAN. Do the initial setup, set the password, give it a name, and install the Synology high availability thing from the package center. You just click install, done. Then on the other Synology that already has all my data, do the same, run the application, and then it says, hey, what's the name and password, or the IP address and password of the other Synology? So five was my primary, six is the new one, that's what I tell it. We go through the configuration, I get some green checks here, and I'm gonna name it Gigantstore, because it's it's funny. Gigantstore is, ah, never mind. Gigantstore is going to show up on the network as, you know, Gigantstore the name, but I've given it the IP address 192.168.1.7. And so it shows up just like it's a third Synology, but it's virtual, it's, it's not real, it's the cluster. Either one of those two Synologies will respond as that. Now, if you're lost or I went too fast, don't worry. Come to the level one forums. There's a step-by-step -step guide with the screenshots. And because my Synology had been used, there was a couple things I had to do, like uh, you know, check a checkbox for the, uh, the V switch thing, because I was using virtual machines on the other Synology. But all in all, it worked fine to migrate my data from the existing Synology I'd been using for a while to the new one. Thanks again to Synology for sponsoring this video. We've got a couple more videos coming up, so make sure you're subscribed or, or otherwise engaged so you don't miss those. I'm Wendell, this is level one. This has been a fun look, I hope, at you know, world backup day stuff. You know, come to the forums and engage, check out the guide. I've got some more step-by-step -step information on what we did here. If you wanna, want me to go a little bit slower and do that kind of stuff, come to the forums, Level 1 Techs. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out, and I'll see you there.